Deep Tracks Only. That is the new theme song right there. I mean, we just wrote it. Can we actually like really write one right now? Ready? Okay, yeah. Okay. Ready. Deep Tracks now, why am I, why am I? Okay. Only. Okay, you, you hit the first note. No, that's what you just did. Deep Tracks Only. That's too slow. On NBC. I feel like we need to add a network to it (laughs) to like really seal the deal. Deep tracks. Friday nights on NBC. TGIF. On F. Full House. Family Matters. I don't remember what was on TGIF. I get them all mixed up since they all like headed to TBS later on. TGIF had Full House at one point? I think so. I don't think so. No. Maybe they didn't. They did? I don't know. Listen, uh, leave comments on what, what uh, I, they were different. It was different every year. Those shows, not every year, but it was just changed in and out on what was on TGIF. If you don't know what TGIF is, um, it was uh, it was Friday nights on what net? What even network was it on? Oh, I guess it was TBS. T- no, T- it was no, not gosh. TBS. It was a, like a main network. It was like ABC, NBC, or uh, ABC, ABC, ABC. It was on ABC. Okay. CBS. That's what I was starting to think of. ABC, NBC, CBS. Um, I was think of like the late night show hosts that own each uh, major network. Uh, but the late night show host that own this network is Philip Hunsicker and Colt Westbrook. We got a really exciting show today, um, and that is something that people that have podcasts say. So they just mm-hmm. say you got to say that crap all the time. We got a, a really exciting. We have got a very exciting show today, and it might not be exciting the podcast that they're talking about, but that's different because this podcast is really exciting because today we have Yvette Young. 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 What a what a charming soul she she's is. She's the sweetest. Yeah. She's very great. Uh, she is smarter than probably both of us uh-huh. combined. Probably, probably combined, yeah. Right? Um, which is great, uh, which is intimidating because uh, it's kind of like interviewing your professor in a lot of ways. Like, you know, like I got to ask the right question to, to pull you know, the, the thing out of the professor that I want to hear because she's so smart. I don't even know where to start. Um, but I feel like I feel like we started in a lot of great places. Uh, we get to some really good stuff today. Yeah. So if you're, yeah, this is at the beginning. We've already talked to Yvette Young. So we're flipping this. So we know that we're bringing you a good show. Or. A good episode. Or we have a time machine. And she's about to, she's about to enter into the show. And. We've already talked to her. She's did about to. She's she's did. She's did about to. uh, And it depends on if you believe in infinite universe, you believe in infinite possibilities. And so we actually already interviewed her yesterday in one universe. Oh man! Oh, man. This is, man uh, I think I think we've lost half the people at this point. Yeah, me is for sure going to be editing yeah. some of this. Um, uh, what, what, one thing we before we get to that, we've got to start with band names. Band names. <laughs> band names. Bananas. Bana- is that your band name today? No, it's not. That'd be a good one. Band names. Bananas. I'm going to let you go first because I know you think you have a good band name, but mine's better. That's okay. Uh, it's not a competition because I win every time. So, uh, the band names. So these are band names. These are not real bands. These are uh, bands that uh, that we have made up, and and these are fictional bands, and we own the trademark to these bands. So if you take one of these band names and use them, uh, we'll sue you. Uh, I mean, just we'll come at you well, with yeah. a fleet of suits. We will come at you with a fleet of suits. <laughs> Unless but, you email us yeah, and yeah. ask us if you can use it, and then we'll just say yes. So uh, today, my band name is Trout Pocket. Oh, that's a good one, Trout Pocket. Trout Pocket. Uh, I uh, Trout Pocket is a ska band from Ohio, and they were on Tooth and Nail in the '90s. They're just from Ohio. They're from just Ohio. <laughs> Where are you from? Ohio. Ohio? Okay. Yeah. And they are a ska band. 
Trap Pocket is for sure a ska band. Um, they just came out with their debut album, uh, Stocked Mosh Pond. Mosh Pond. Yeah. And uh, they are actually going on tour with, wait for it, Five Iron Frenzy. Did, was that you already? Was that what already? <laughs> what, 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 uh, Five Iron Frenzy. I feel like we already used them on tour with somebody. No, I don't I have Just kidding. Nothing. No. Dude, hmm. what's your... What's your problem? <laughs> I thought that we... Dude, what is wrong with you Maybe we were just talking about it recently. Golly. I mean, you woke up today ready to kill. Dude. You are sassy. All Re- right. I are really you ready for my band? Yeah, I really don't like this version of you. I hope it <laughs> changes pretty soon. Uh, my band this week is Salad Dallas. Salad, <laughs> salad with two L's. It's literally just Dallas backwards. That is a good band name. Salad Dallas. Salad Dallas. Yeah. And they you, you have are, to say it Salad Dallas. Salad not Dallas. Salad, not Salad like, Dallas. You do Salad not, Dallas. You do not pause at all. Yeah. Salad Dallas. No. And they are Americanica band. What's that? Americana and Electronica. So <sighs> uh think think Avicii Avicii. Wake me up. Wake me up when I don't know the words. Anyways. I don't. I don't know it. You do. There's no way. Do they play? Do they play it at the bowling alley? They they would. Yeah. Then I would know it. Uh, their debut album is 808s and Lap Steels, and they are from Calgary, Alberta. Calgary, yeah. Alberta. Yeah. Um, we should go there. We should go to to Banff, Banff National Park. Let's go and. They're out on tour with Trout Bucket. It's crazy. <laughs> That's a crazy. It's insane. Yeah. Full circle. Dude, it's wild. I mean, we yeah. just made a full Man. circle. I That's... mean, I when I planned my band name, I had no <laughs> idea that your band name was out on tour with my band Isn't name. Isn't that crazy? That I, is... Whenever I heard you say Trout Pocket, I was like, there's no freaking way. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> my band is out on tour with them. Oh. I had no idea. This That's is amazing. great. Well, hey, let's see what Yvette thinks about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Yvette Young, everybody. Hey, welcome to the show, Yvette Young. Uh, did I say young right? You said all of it right, I think. Did I say young correctly? You know, you can say it however you want. Okay. I, I just, that, it made me, you know. Yes. I got a vet right, but Young was the one that made me nervous. So maybe like like hold out the um for like an extra second. <laughs> it's my it's uh, I'm from the Great Plains, and so it just it, it's it's difficult for us to get those things right. Why well, bet Young? <laughs> That's here we go. That sounded really good. Um, <laughs> you have to sit with the French accent. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's just do a little geographical check in real quick. Where are you? Um, I'm in Calabasas right now to. Uh, film some stuff with um, Yamaha slash Line 6. <gasps> so fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Is that, is that an okay reaction to have to <gasps> Yamaha and Line 6? <gasps> I mean, yeah, they're freaking so awesome. I, don't, I can't tell if it's sarcastic. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Good Lord. It, no, no. No. So, I, listen, I'm probably in the minority, but I'm a huge Yamaha fan. I mean, I've been a Yamaha fan for a long time. This guy. In the minority? Dude, there's no way. <laughs> I know. So, Yamaha? Philip's like, sales you're in. The, you're in the yeah. majority. <laughs> okay, great. Um, but I do feel like there's a like a majority of people that, that opt into Yamaha just because of access. Like it's, the, it's one of the most ubiquitous things around. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's any less great. I have a Yamaha. Uh, I have an acoustic from, uh, is it like 1980? It's like a jumbo body. Something SJ, I don't know. F, is it one is of the F series? Fractal? No. Is fractal isn't fractal XFX or is is fractal part of? Huh? I I but it, a fractal is is its own entity. But I didn't say anything about fractal. Did you hear me say something about fractal? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So then, like, why birds? I'm. <laughs> Why male models? <laughs> but why male models? Have you seen Zoolander? I have. Yeah, classic. It's, yeah, it's part of the. I mean, it's part of the gospels of high school. Girl. That's actually what we're doing you have today. To is we're going to watch it. it. 
Um, I'm a huge Yamaha fan. So are you filming video for Yamaha in Line 6? Yeah, um, they're they're doing this cool thing. Um, instead of focusing on like gear, they're kind of just trying to highlight their artists. So uh, it's been a really fun time. Creative, That's think awesome. creative, and trying to find ways to kind of not make it like a commercial or anything. Yeah, man. Big fan of Yamaha. That's awesome. Yeah. Who can Who can make great pianos and great ATVs? At the same time. There's nobody else that can do that, you know? <laughs> Don't forget I, motorcycles. Yeah, motorcycles. motorcycles. Dude, they, and they're all good. Yeah. It's incredible. I, the, I grew up playing a Yamaha Baby Grand, so I have a lot of affinity for Yamaha just growing up in my life. But hey, I, I want it, you know, I know a lot of people, um, like you're a very recognizable uh, person uh, because of your presence and your talent. But I do want, I, like, kind of from your perspective, um, I want you to maybe profile, uh, like, kind of your art and your band for if for somebody, like, if you're standing in line at Starbucks and it's it's kind of getting awkward that you're all standing there looking at your phones and you just kind of have that thing of, like, you know what, I'm going to put down my phone and pay attention to the world around me. And then you start talking to somebody and they're like, yeah, and you say, I'm in a, I'm in a band. How would you describe that band to that person in Starbucks waiting for their flat white? So when you say describe your art in your band, you just mean band, right? Because she also does art. We'll get there, but band right cool. now. Okay, cool. Um, if this person is older than 40, I might say uh, for fans of like Rush, like maybe some King Crimson Yes vibes, like it's proggy, but it's got like I don't know. I'm really inspired by a lot of like 80s tones, especially for the new record. Uh huh. Yeah. So maybe something like that. If it's younger, I'm like, you like American football? Oh, Do yeah. you like, um, I don't know. Uh, I guess it's, I, if I say math rock, that always leads to people asking, well, what's that? Sounds right. difficult. And then and I get to, if I want to continue the conversation, then I would probably say that so that I can tell them what that math rock is a subset of progressive rock music. But if I'm feeling introverted, then I would probably just say it's like instrumental prog. Sometimes it's vocals. I'm inspired a lot by like post rock as well. And she yeah. is. I think it's, I think you did a really good job profiling your band. That was great. I have a question. Um, I think some people, throw out the term math rock as slang for prog rock would you say that those are one and the same and if they're different how would you describe the difference between math rock and prog rock i feel like that's such they're so different that it's hard to even answer that honestly uh i i don't care what people think my music falls under like it doesn't really the label doesn't really matter to me it's like however you want to understand it um and however you want to like explain it to people. But I feel like progressive rock music, I've always viewed it as like a broad thing, prog rock. And then math rock sits here with like, I don't know, maybe progressive rock. Progressive just implies that it's doing something that's like pushing the envelope, right? I feel like that's what the word means. So maybe math rock means that in particular, it's the, the, the progressive thing about it is that it's playing with odd meter and compound time signatures uh -huh. whereas something else could be progressive maybe it's pushing sound like noise rock mm -hmm. it's still progressive but it's, maybe it's in four so i i feel like maybe that's how but but within math rock itself there's like a huge variety of tones and sounds but i feel like all of them are unified just by odd meter yeah i think that's interesting i i, I th like different types of music start striking different parts of the human um so there's 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 parts of music, there's music that like pushes at the heart, you know, and there's parts yeah. of music that, that push at the mind. Right. Yeah. And then there's music that just pushes at the body, which I think is what hyper pop is doing. Like it makes you want to like jump through a wall or like, uh, I throw my hands up in the air sometimes. I mean, that's body music. That makes me want to, you know, put my hands up in the air, but just sometimes, um, but I feel, yeah, but I feel like where you, where you come in, where your music comes in, is it kind of, uh, it kind of dances the line between attacking the mind and pushing the heart a little bit, because there are these beautiful melodies, uh, that kind of come out, um, even just on little clips that you post 
on Instagram uh, that really kind of pull at the heartstrings, but at the same time, they're pulling at the mind. So it's kind of like a full experience. Is that on purpose? Are you doing that? That means a lot. Um, you know, when I, the way I write is so, I, I don't really have like any specific goal when I write something other than to write a melody that is catchy and tell some kind of story. And then the, I think the thing that pulls on the head thing, I never really set out to do that. Like for some reason, that's just kind of my, my language. Um, yeah. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's my musical upbringing, but um, I end up writing things unintentionally in odd meter that unintentionally like kind of like are more free form or maybe are more technical, but I like to call it detailed because uh-huh. <laughs> I go really in there and I really care about like little passing tones and like just like all of that stuff. And the technique, of course, I do like tapping at times. But um, yeah, I guess it the emotional part, probably intentional. Uh I, I really personally enjoy music that makes me feel something. Yeah. yeah. So this is funny. I've had this conversation before, but with somebody sitting next to me in calculus in high school and me basically saying like, how did you get an A on the test? And then they reply, I don't know. I just did. Uh, and then I got a C on the test. So it's kind of like, how do you write music that's so smart? And it's like, I don't know. It just comes out. I'm like, okay. I'm great, just talented. Awesome. That's it. Yeah. Also, just- you said earlier, you don't really care about how people uh, label your music. So are you fine if I put you guys down as like an Americana Americana band? Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> sure. <All right. laughs> that sounds accurate. Yeah. I would, I mean, I would, I would pay you like $20 to write an Americana song. You know, twenty dollars. Can, can it be? Can you stay in four four? We'll see. We will see. Oh man! You know what? I actually have successfully done it. So, one thing that I I I just talked to my band about this, but some of my favorite groups I've listened to, it's hard to pinpoint them in a genre because they're just doing so many things. Um, a band I always love to reference and talk about is Mew. I feel like they. Oh my gosh! Like I don't really know how to describe. Yeah. Their sound. They're dreamy, they're proggy, they're so proggy, but you're dancing to it. Uh-huh. And they're so, they take so many risks with their music that just end up being like amazing. Um, it's very theatrical, it's very dramatic and post rock like at moments. It's very shoegaze like at moments. Did you, did you say Mew? M E W. Okay. Mew. I was going to say yeah. spell that. <laughs> From Denmark. Mm-hmm. But I think one thing that I set out to do with, with my project is, um, I really like being able to write a broad, like, I don't want people to be able to like really pinpoint what every song sounds like. I kind of like variety sure. and I, and with every album, I try to do something new that I'm kind of uncomfortable with, like playing around. I'm still in like the exploration experimental stage. Um, and I do that also because I'm thinking about touring and I feel like I like to be able to have sets that are maybe like, for instance, I'm doing a post rock festival, so I can do like a purely post rock instrumental set. And mm. then if I need to go to like a tech, whatever, like metal lineup, then I have a set that's fitting for that. Or if I'm playing with like a shoegaze indie band, I have like, you know, that kind of stuff. That's so. incredible. That, and that does sound like Mew to me because, you know, and I don't know if you mentioned it, but they also kind of got lumped into the emo scene at the same time. Yeah. yeah. I grew up listening. I found them through the emo scene. Right. But then you start listening to it and you're like, there's something how do I say this the right way? There's something else here besides the emo genre. That's so I found them through just basically emo music. Somebody handed it to me as like, Hey, you're sad. Listen to this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's a great example. And also something for me to go do, uh, later on is go listen to some, some Mew. I mean, I haven't done that in maybe I, 10 years. I haven't done that in every years. If you want the bangers, go listen to Frangers. That wasn't a rhyme on purpose. Um, and then there's an album that is like No More Stories Are Told Today. Like It's like huge, long album name. But yeah, you yeah. just look up No More Stories. Yeah. The song that I like get really hyped on is um, uh, Introducing Palace Players. That beginning, that riff is so cool. Um, yeah, it's like a really nasty tone. I love it. Okay, so you are in Calabasas. What's your daily routine? I mean, you know. Besides, besides doing the sauna and then the ice bath and then, and then just eating raw meat, like pure, (laughs) I just put ground beef in a Ziploc bag and I microwave it. Mm. And then I just like suck it up, you know, you have to add some lemon. 
and eggs so raw and raw eggs just the yolk <laughs> did you did you follow me around this morning that's amazing <laughs> That's that, exactly that's, what I did. What, what's your daily routine? What it's um, I know it's different because you're touring and you're working and you're over here. But but do you have a couple of things that you hold on to to keep to stay sane? Yeah, um, I've been really into. Well, okay, first of all, I, this is not my morning routine. Is not going to a hotel in Calabasas. Like when I'm working, I feel like I'm just moving around a lot. And to some extent, I feel like I'm pretty used to this pace of life. Just like having to be in a million places. But some things I do to stay grounded. Um, especially when I'm home, I wake up and I make myself a tea. I usually put turmeric in it because turmeric's great. Uh-huh. Um, and then I go and I like, let's say my task for the day, I have this board of things that I have to do and, um, objectives I have to accomplish. Some of them are like concrete, like, okay, you need to do a demo for this. Um, but others are like, okay, I have a bunch of music that I need to finish. So I actually treat writing kind of like a job like clock in for. Um, I try every day. So let's say it's a writing day. I would make the tea. I light a candle because I like things to smell nice. Yeah. And then I go ahead and I just like maybe warm up by practicing something. And then I try to just finish a song if I can. Yeah. Uh, when you wow. say board, uh, what is, what's the board? What is that? I have a whiteboard that has like, I have three different projects and then I have things that I'm writing maybe for other people, like collabs in in progress. Um, So I'll go and choose one thing that I have to do Um, right now. Like, let's say I go home to my board. My, uh, I just finished the covet record. So I don't have to think about that anymore. And I am just trying to focus. I haven't released solo material in like four years just because I've been so busy with my band. Yeah. writing for my band. Um, and I'm probably going to just end up focusing on tying up those loose ends and maybe trying to get an album together for next year, question mark. Um, so yeah, that's the board. And then I have another one with like little note cards um, with various things that I don't want to forget to do. Like, oh, do the merch, do a hoodie design for tour. Like I do all the visual art for the band uh-huh. too. And we have this tour coming up. So there's a lot of that, like, oh, you got to format this flyer, things like that. Um, and then I have an additional board for when I am working on a song. And it's like every little riff that I have and it places the riff in context. So it's like, oh, I have this riff that's like a climax or I have this riff that's like an intro. Or I have this, and then I figure yeah. out what, what I'm missing and I work around yeah. that. That's so really cool. Something in music shifted, uh, maybe like two, started shifting about two decades ago where, uh, I mean, obviously record sales started going like this as streaming came out and Napster and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and what that really did is it, is it gave rise to uh, what a lot of people call like the, the blue collar musician. So people who are, who are hustling, have uh, productivity uh, gifts or productivity addictions um, and things like that. Is that kind of where you see yourself fitting like as a blue collar musician? Like I, I am always kind of on the hunt for like the next thing to do and the next thing I have to get done. You know, it's funny. I am always on the hunt for a vacation, which I have not taken in <laughs> years now. Yeah. And I feel like my motivation comes from this sounds cheesy, I swear. I am very excited about music still doing uh-huh. it after like for so many years. Like I still get like butterflies when I write something and it's like the exact right breakup and the amp and, it, and it's like cool I don't know like yeah I, I, I think to me it feels like falling in love with something when I get to write so that's my favorite thing in the whole world so that gets me up every day um that alone is enough to get me up every day but I also have a whole team of people who depend on me and then I have like you know, label album deadlines. So I feel Uh like I'm very deadline motivated. I'm very motivated. You had me take that Enneagram test a while ago. I did. Um, I'm very motivated by not letting people down. And I know that's unrealistic because you, you end up inevitably by taking care of yourself, you might have to let a couple of people down here and there, but yeah, I just always want to meet those deadlines and I like feeling productive. Yeah. That was really my answer. (laughs) That was a good answer though. I like, um, uh, yeah, I like feeling productive, but, um, what you have that I feel like, um, 
maybe a lot of people could glean from is, is really a system of accountability for yourself to be able to get things done. So say, pretend like I'm an artist and, I, and I'm just obsessed with writing songs, but I have a hard time hitting deadlines. I got a hard time texting my band back. I have a hard time booking rehearsal times. Um, kind of like create and, and tell me about like a system, like a whiteboard and note cards and all this kind of stuff. Like, like sell that to me so that I can progress to the next thing that I want to be doing. What would you tell me? I would say if you're someone who just struggles with building structure for yourself, because really the key to being self-employed is having some form of structure, right? Um, Otherwise you kind of feel, I feel when, when I'm aimless, I feel uninspired and unproductive because I simply have like uh, option paralysis and I don't know what to do with my time. But, and I would say if you're starting out, set, set really small, achievable goals. It's also a really easy way to build self-esteem because if you wake up and you're like, today I will play like, I will write one riff instead of I will write one song today. I'll write one riff for a potential song. Mm -hmm. Then of course you're going to be able to do it or not. But at least if you try, you know, that's still something that still counts. Honorable mention. Just kidding. (laughs) Um, But yeah, if you end up just setting a small achievable goal for yourself, then you end up that kind of by itself is exhilarating and euphoric. And then the next day you're like, wow, I wrote that riff. Like, I wonder what I, where I can go from there. So I think so many musicians are turned off by that, you know, just by, by structure, because they feel like that kills creativity. The key is structure on your own terms. It's not someone else breathing down your neck. Like, where's that riff? I need to double stapled on my desk, double space, you know, like that kind of thing is a turn off. But for me, Like if I get to work on my own project, I do need, st- I think personally, I thrive with structure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. One thing that I just gave a, a little lecture on this at the Vi Academy thing I taught, but um, creativity what actually. What's the Vi, what is that? See Vi Academy is like this like shredder camp with legends. It's like, it was wild. Uh-huh. Dude, that wasn't wild. Did you, Steve Vi. It's Steve Vi, Steve, the Steve Vi Academy, right? Yeah. C-Vi okay. Academy. Gotcha. I'm just, I'm demystifying that just to make sure we're all on the same page. Gotcha. Yeah. It was and so that, cool. And that you're friends with Steve Vai. I, he was kind enough to ask me to go teach. So, and he's a lovely person. I was, it was honestly like a re- real treat and granted yeah. everything I've been going through, it was really inspiring for me. So, um, yeah, uh, going back to, I was talking about creativity, creativity, uh, arises the part of your brain responsible for being creative actually is becomes the most active when you're problem solving so sometimes you know people think being creative comes from limitlessness yes but actually what that does is create a lot of anxiety in people because then you're faced with option paralysis but if you give yourself a prompt when you wake up and you're like okay well today i need to write a bridge section or today i ooh, i heard something that had this really cool compound meter section that was like uh it went from five to seven to nine and i'd like to write a riff that kind of like replicates that then that's giving yourself an assignment and for me i feel like i then become creative i feel the cogs turning because i'm like all right well i have an objective to fulfill and it's it's fun trying to problem solve you said something earlier that i want you to say again uh structure on your own terms will you what is that um i feel like if someone's giving me a deadline it stresses me out So that's structure on someone else's terms. Mm -hmm. I can still do it. Like, I think it's important to be able to do stuff that like you don't like. That's how you grow. Yeah. But um, for me, structure on my own terms would be like, it's really like maybe make, maybe it's a time for reflection. Maybe have a journal and write like, what is important to me? Like, what are my goals? Why do I even make music? And for me, I feel like just a side, I feel like music making, writing music is a very selfish thing that I do and I'm totally okay with that like I have to write for myself Mm -hmm. I like for instance I'm in I'm in a privileged position where I can do that like I'm not like writing serial jingles or something and not to say that's bad but like I would find it more difficult to like write a jingle for like booberry or something you know so um (laughs) actually that sounds kind of dope yeah maybe that's my assignment for today but (laughs) but yeah I feel like for me 
I picked up guitar because it was like such a healthy, like an important healthy outlet for me growing up when I was a teen. Yeah. And to this day, it's really important that I preserve that sacred outlet relationship. Um, and that means doing things on my own terms. So uh, if I if I wake up, like when I write music, I want to tell a story. I want it to make you feel something. So maybe that's my objective. So whatever I do, like I got to make sure that like, oh, like let's say I wrote like the climax of a story, then I want to write the intro. So to me, that's like, I, in terms of like the bigger picture goal that I have, I have like smaller objectives that I want to fulfill that all relate to each other. Yeah. It's like a really abstract thing. No, I, it's I not. It, it, it is a little nuanced, um, but, but art really is. And so there's freedom there. Um, uh, you're talking about songs in terms of, I mean, the denouement, the climax, you know, the plot, all those kinds of things. Um, That's the name of the last track on the new record. That's so funny. What wow. is it? Denouement? Denouement, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, That's I hope it. my English teacher's listening. Uh, from this <laughs> this I is love that word. Sally, Sally Wachowitz. That was her name, Stillwater yeah. High School. She Not made a, a, Sally. Yeah, she got a 36 on the ACT twice. So. Wow. Yeah, no big deal. Um, what's up, Sally? The uh, what you're still inspired to make music um, besides other people's music. Uh, what inspires you to create? Like, what other art forms or what activities or what sequences or what routines inspire you uh, to to keep making music? My friends, um, there. Sometimes I'll listen. Like, I have friends who are making such cool things and I'm just like oh my gosh like people need to hear this I remember I was just hanging out with my friend and he showed me some music he was working on and I was just like I, I felt my face hurting because I was smiling so hard because it's so cool and that yeah. really really made me want to go home and and I've been working on like I'm such so basic I'm not trying to say I'm a producer but I've been really into like I think the chapter of this life I'm like really bomb production on something like really clever little details in the song I think that makes for like it makes a good song into like a great song and a lot of times people listening passively don't even like really appreciate or like notice these little things but if you really zoom in like to me that's really exciting so what? that that's my long answer stop right there give me an example of of one of those things like what that is oh, okay like the other day I was listening to a song I think it was like an Alto Apollo song or something. Yeah. And they had this one, this re the, the vocal production is really cool. And then I noticed he like trailed off on one note and then they automated the reverb to be, to go from like subtle to like crazy big. And it sounded like a cloud. I, there's probably like a term for doing that, but I just thought that was such a cool production choice. And if it didn't have that, the song would still exist. It would still be fine. Mm -hmm. But that's what took it from being a cool, a cool, an okay, like it's not okay. It's a good song, but it, that little detail just made it so much cooler, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So does that go into a, an art gallery? I feel like really inspires me because I'm just, the two things for me are so um, related to each other, the visual part and the audio part. I would say traveling definitely um, when you're in, it's so funny. This is part of my like Vi Academy thing too, but like there's just little ways to like trick yourself into um, feeling creative and inspired. Um, being in a new place can definitely bring out new feelings. Um, I know when I go on tour, I don't get to write for a month. And to me, that's kind of, I, I get a little depressed about it. Mm -hmm. um, even though I'm performing every day, it kind of feels like I'm neglecting something that I really love to do. So when I go home, I feel all creatively congested. And that to me is just like enough to get me to write, 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 write. Um, so it's really important for me to have time off after touring so I can nurture that, that part of myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are some things. <laughs> Friends inspire. Art museums inspire. Production elements inspire. Um, yeah, I feel like good production is is like it's like a good book, you know, and like subtle things like that in pieces of music make the song uh, like increase the song's longevity in someone's appreciation of it because you keep listening back and then you'll find something new about the song that you not might not necessarily have heard the first time. It's kind of like wine. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Like a little side chaining and stuff just makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. So cool. That's amazing. Um, so what you sound 
you sound like you're pretty packed with music right now. Is there something else that you do uh, that when you're not writing music and when you're not touring and when you're not in the studio, do you have something else to, that you do for fun? I do enjoy, like while I've been in um, L.A., Calabasas. This is my first day in Calabasas, but I'm I'm in the general LA area for now. It's really nice catching up with friends. Um, I feel like I I jokingly call myself the worst friend ever because I'm really difficult to reach. Like I don't know if you can I can show you guys my phone, but like you know just the oh you oh wait right here you can see uh what the text that? and the e- <sighs> I saw the email. That says what, what, what number was that on the text? That badge says forty four thousand. That the was that was it was one hundred forty six, um, oh, which is fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really do actually enjoy face to face interaction. To me, that that's nice. Um, and then I would I enjoy hikes, of course, being in nature. Um, I love swimming in the ocean, but I don't get to do that during the winter. Uh, and I take care of animals and I paint and I draw. That right there. You do all the art for your album covers? Yeah, and all the merch. Oh my gosh. Have you always, is that something you've always done? Like yes. all the visuals for the band? Where did that, yeah. when, did, when did that start? Um, like when did visual art and things like that start? Did it start early on, like around the same time as music for you or did it come later? Started before music. Music, I actually, funny story, I hated music when I was a kid because I was forced into the classical world and like I was competing. And to me, competition isn't motivating. It is, it does the opposite for me. It gives me anxiety. Oh, sure. Um, and it wasn't until I taught myself guitar where I decided, again, music on my own terms. Um, yeah. Obligate, it's not no longer an obligation for someone else. And that totally made me fall in love with everything again. And um, then art, like visual art, when I was little, I always wanted to be an artist. I went to UCLA and I doubled, I double majored in fine arts and um, visual performing arts education because I really, at the time, I wanted to teach i wanted to do art therapy i wanted to be around like younger people and get them to see the value of having the creative arts as an outlet Mm -hmm. um and i got to do that for a little bit but then i had to quit because i posted a video on facebook it went viral it led to like all this other stuff and then now here i am being in a band and playing guitar for a living yeah um but I mean, the two, like the cool thing about being an art major and an education major is I still get to do both those things. Like I do our video treatments. Um, I um, do all of the like, you know, merch design, graphic design portion of it. I, I'm working on a backdrop for our live show right now. Like I'm going to go home. I, I went and I like bought a bunch of unstretched canvas and I primed it and I'm planning on like doing something for um, really DIY production on this run. Um, and also I get to teach, like I did that via Academy camp. I did the anime key camp and it's like, to me, really fun getting to basically use everything I studied in this like new context. Yeah. Why do you like, why do you like to teach? I like to teach because, well, I suppose my, my really honest answer is I see myself in a lot of kids like, and, um, like I was working with a lot of high schoolers who were trying to apply for college and I was helping kind of figure out their portfolio situation. Um, I applied to art school secretly. Like my parents didn't really know. Um, I went to UCLA, but I, they didn't know I was going as an art major. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for them, they were a little bit worried about that. So I would like do it and then I'd put everything under my bed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so my story is a little funny and I really love like the, the the kids that I used to work with, they're I guess they're teenagers technically. They would be like, "My mom wants me to go here. My mom wants me to do this." And I'm like, "All right, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? This isn't their life. It's your life. So <laughs> this yeah. is your life. Are you who you want to be? You know?" Said a really cool band called Switch, but. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, something interesting you said, I see myself in a lot of these kids. What is that? What is that thing you see in other kids like that when you're teaching? The specific group I was working with, I think I saw people who were trying to live up to maybe someone else's expectations for them. And 
one thing that I've had to learn, maybe perhaps late in the game, is you can't always live for other people, you know? And uh-huh. I'm a people pleaser. I love to make other people happy. And I love, I don't like the feeling of, like I said earlier, disappointing someone. But sometimes, you know, you have to carve your own path. And um, a lot of the, the kids I w- worked with, they showed obvious interest in some things, but they were trying so hard to fit in a mold that wasn't them. And, you know, for me, I, I mean, I've said this in other interviews, so I feel super comfortable talking about it. I developed an eating disorder when I was young, and that mm-hmm. was because I was put in this rigorous academic environment and kind of being pushed to fit in this like mold of this rigid person, maybe on track to be a doctor, a scientist or whatever. And I just didn't feel passionate about that. Like I was neglecting all these things that I actually cared about. Mm -hmm. And I think life's too short to be miserable forever. So what, yeah. What redeemed that season? Like what, what pulled you out of that, out of that season? You know, what was the hope? What was the light? What, what do you mean? What is the season? When when you said, when you were talking about, um, when you were living under heavy expectations and you were having, you going through an eating disorder and things like that, like what, what was the hope and the light that kind of pulled you out of that? Sometimes you have to go through the worst storm of your life in order to kind of have closure and calm at the other side. And I feel like that storm for me was, you know, I've experienced various storms. arguably in one now but like i think um the eating disorder for me was like a hard reset it made everyone around me stop like my parents were like okay i was in the hospital like i was like living in the hospital yeah so i can't do i can't do school i'm like doing school um, with with, like an iv in my arm you know it's like yeah it's wild and what that really did was it kind of forced everyone to reevaluate priorities yes and i think everyone in that moment it's like your health your life Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That that's all you have, really. If you don't have those two things, you can't do anything else. Like everything else doesn't mean anything. So when I slowed down, I was like, you know what? I'm going to teach myself guitar. I really like writing music on guitar. I love bands. I always want to be in a band. Maybe I'll start writing songs with the goal of maybe one day I can play in a band. And then I was like drawing for fun. Um, yeah. And so yeah, I think that actually made everything better. It was like a forced restructuring. Yeah. Uh, Tell me about the timeline between, you know, kind of that reset and then the video you posted that went viral and things kind of started a new, a new season for you. What was, what happened in between those two things? I went to college. I studied, I did the whole UCLA thing. Yeah. I graduated. I moved home. I started teaching and it's so funny. I didn't want to be on social media. It was never my goal. Um, I think like default Yvette would, this sounds like, um, an oxymoron or something, but I actually enjoy being quite invisible. Like it's a lot of pressure to have a lot of eyes on you all the time. So I wanted to stay low key. Um, but my student made an Instagram for me. She's like, you got to keep in touch with everyone else and you got to like post videos and you should do this and you should do that. And so she made it for me. And then that day I got like, (sighs) Because I had people from Facebook already. Yeah. Um, my Instagram blew up. Like, I think I got like 5,000 followers or something the first day or something like that. Wow. Um, it was it was wild. Yeah, I didn't, my phone wouldn't stop going off. And then I was like, all right, I might as well use this as a thing to, do- a way to document um, maybe my progress in writing. Um, and my relationship with it has definitely transformed. Like initially it was really exciting. Cause I'm like, wow, I'm getting all these like, uh, endorsements and, um, I get to go on tour and I, I can just post a thing and then people will come to shows because I already have this following, you know? Um, so that was really cool. And I think, uh, eventually of course some things changed and now it's at a point where it definitely, I treat it more like a job. Um, yeah. I, I do enjoy certain aspects of it, but to me, it's never the end in itself. It, it always has to be like a means to an end. Yeah. Um, and also Wait, I have to- Can you to, stop there? What do you mean by that? Um, I mean, like, I don't write art for, I don't make art for social media. Like there's stuff that I make, like I admittedly will make content. Like I think everyone who is on Instagram mm-hmm. makes content. Yeah. So I do do that. <laughs> I said do-do, sorry. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> 
That, that joke I, stinks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I, I make content, but I also have wider goals. Like I'm doing all this stuff because I want to release an album because I want to um, push myself to do something I'm uncomfortable with. I'd like to work on production. So um, I'm doing all these things. I'm learning some gear because I, I have this like bigger goal in yeah. mind, like a big picture. I was just going to say, um, and the way I treat social media these days is post and leave. Like I don't mm-hmm. really scroll. I have certain people I check up on, but if you're listening and I don't like your stuff, it's because I'm probably not. I mean, just don't see it. I have to <laughs> live this way. I can't be on that thing. I have to step away. It sounds like, uh, Yvette, when, um, you know, early on in your uh, like professional music career, there was a lot of opportunistic things that came up. And it was probably really easy to say yes to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd say now you're at the point where Um, There's still like lots of opportunistic things that are coming up, but you do have to stay strategic instead. So how do you prioritize like opportunistic things coming your way versus trying to be strategic to support uh, your brand, your band, and then the people that work for you? Does that make sense? Can you define opportunistic? So say, um, uh, you know, you you're getting a lot of popularity um musically and then three guitar pedal companies come to you and say hey will you film a demo hey will you be our endorsed artist a guy comes up and says hey will you open for me on this tour and then three record labels come up and they're like hey we want to do like three albums with your band and so you're you're there's a lot of opportunity coming your way but you have to kind of be strategic about the things that are opportunistic if that makes sense like you can't just say yes to everything you can't have three record labels and you can't work for you know three music gear companies so i mean what do you do yeah how do you stay strategic i think it's it's important to when you early on in in your music career i think it's important to make a list of why you do it and what's important to you because it's easy i think it becomes later really easy quite easy to lose sight of that um, and then end up in a place where you feel weird. I think one feeling that I pay attention to a lot these days is dissonance. Um, and I kind of let that feeling guide me. Um, it's not always so obvious, but I try to avoid that feeling of dissonance. Um, what that means, it could be creative dissonance. It could be moral mm-hmm. dissonance. It could be all these kinds of dissonance. Um, so I think one thing that I think about, I kind of, I'm, I'm a pretty loyal person. I think like I like having the same friends for a really long time, really like love and care about the people in my life. And I kind of treat, you know, my, who I work with like that. I'm I'm not trying to just have this like short term temporary thing. Cause I get really invested. And I think in every, with every company that I work with, I try to figure out like, is this something that will, will be helpful and um, be sustainable? Uh, long term um it is time to ask a favorite christmas movie what's the best christmas movie sometimes our favorites really aren't the best so maybe your favorite christmas movie and then what do you think is actually the best christmas movie huh that's an interesting (laughs) one because my cousin and i grew up with this christmas tradition of watching a uh scary movie on christmas Uh uh-huh like santa's sleigh remember that one or unrelated to christmas yeah exactly yeah (laughs) <laughs> Did you make up Santa's sleigh? No, it's real. Oh, is that really real? Wow, mm-hmm. I have to check it out. Yeah, don't. Um, I feel like there's like an obvious answer for this that I'm missing. I don't think I've watched a Christmas movie in a while. Like for some reason, I'm just remembering this one Christmas where we decided it would be cool to watch Silence of the Lambs. Um, not not particularly <laughs> a Christmas vibe. No, but no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh man did you think that you rented like silent night but it was silence of the lambs or something like that like, no it was a conscious decision by everyone to watch it like i don't know it's like a family thing too we just like being scared so, so i think that's why me and my cousin decided to watch silence it. of the lamb of god that's why we watched oh there it you go christmas <laughs> there we go um you know what i'm gonna say elf i feel like a lot of people like elf oh, listen <laughs> 
it's it's all about. No, I'm not going to say what my favorite Christmas movie. Thank you for listening, Alf. Uh, I think it's a fantastic one, and I hope more people pick it. Uh, last question for you today before we go. What's a question that I didn't ask, that, that we didn't ask you that you wish you would have asked, that you wish we would have asked? It's. I feel like I'm more interested in asking you guys questions than having questions asked for me because I feel like I've talked about myself a lot. And well, you're maybe, the guest on the show. <laughs> you know why. what? I wish that you asked me what's a question that you would ask me. How about we do this again, but the next time we do it, you just do the <laughs> entire interview with now, us. I'm kind of I'm entering like a wormhole real quick. So what did you just ask? I said. I said, the question that I wish you asked me was, in quotes, what's a question that you would ask me? Yvette, what's a question that you would ask me? What, what is success to you? Like, when are you successful? Oh, when are you successful? Um, are you I've, there yet? I, uh, I don't believe in success. I don't believe... Um, Post-success society I, I think that i think that success is an illusion because i think the i think the line continually moves from where you at i think success is a carrot being dangled in front of us um and in the way that that we think about success whether it's finances possession uh networks or influence um i think i think a real caliber uh, or a measuring stick for success would be um, a trust between a committed group of friends, right? Um, yeah. That don't give a rip about what you do for a living. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And uh, I think I, like I'm a big believer in committed, like committed romantic relationships. So if, if uh, I, I think that, that that is success. So say whether you're in a relationship for a long time or whether you're you're married, I think I think committed uh, monogamous relationships are super important uh, to people because it, it's easy to to fall in love with the best version of of people. Um, you know, but in the first year, you really just kind of get the highlight reel for a lot of people's lives. And this is this is coming from uh, Joni Mitchell. This is Joni Mitchell's ideology on on relationships. So this is not this is not mine. But if you go back and look at Joni Mitchell's uh, ideology of monogamy, it's actually really interesting. It's really good. Um, but uh, but in what she says, and these are her words. But um, if you if you date person to person, um, they just get the highlight reel of your life uh, and they get all the jokes that everyone else has got. But if you wake up to, with the same person for many, many years, um, you, you, start, those, those, you start to die to yourself and you start to uh, you know, live in a way where you are working for uh, mutually the good of somebody else. And if that's happening on both ends, then that's a, that's a really healthy existence. I think to me that that is success, if that makes sense. No, I get it. It's like, I don't know. I think that kind of relates to how um, love should be unconditional. So it's like if you are invested in something, you should be just as invested in the highs as you are in the lows. Yeah. And all about kind of that, that's how you develop loyalty. Like all of my best relationships have been when people have seen me at points in my life where I needed help or I wasn't doing great. And when right. after the storm, then it's like, wow, you're still here. Like, yeah. that's so dope. And I trust you even more, you know? Yeah. I think it's easy to fall in love and appreciate, and I don't mean fall in love romantically, but but just fall in love mm -hmm. with, with people um, and appreciate people for uh, what the world sees them as, if that makes sense, yeah. versus yeah. who they actually are, right? Can, yeah. So I bet, for, I bet for you it's difficult you know, to have, uh, like to have people come up to you and just fan girl or fan boy, like all over, you know, and just like, you're the greatest, you're the best. Is that easy or difficult for you? I'm very bad at compliments. I feel like they make me uncomfortable because I, I'm, I just don't, I just don't know. It's just that I had to work on saying thank you and not just being like, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. like, <laughs> um, Yeah. 
Wait, I want to hear Philip's answer, and then I had one more question for both. Of you. <laughs> I, I mean, I would have said something different, but hearing Colt say that, I mean, he nailed it. Money, money, <laughs> money is success to me. I'm kidding. That's a total joke. <laughs> what is success to you? Phil? I had all these people back here doing the dollar signs. What is it? I'm, I'm saying. I think honestly, hearing you <laughs> say those words, that is because. It's what not, said. not, there's no, I mean, I don't think you can reach <laughs> success in anything. Anything I think about, like, yeah. you know, that was successful, but you know, what is success? Like, yeah. Well, you see it all the time. You see, you see people achieve like, like unrealistic amounts of success. Like, uh -huh. like imagine being Harrison Ford, but then, yeah. but oh. then Harrison Ford then goes backwards and starts craving uh, like alone time and he like point proven he uh, he's a helicopter pilot and him and his buddy landed at a local airport just about 15 miles north of here uh, about a year ago and uh, they landed just needed some gas and things like that and he was like no pictures no nothing and they're like please and he's like I'm sorry guys I, nothing he's like I'm just out flying helicopters and so here is the king of multiple franchises and just success to him is flying across the country in a helicopter. That's why it's important to make that list going back to earlier. Like, why do you even do any, any of what you do? Like, what's the point? Like I, again, the, like material things like they can totally. go. Yeah. I, but, I think yeah. getting older and having a family, <clears throat> really not a lot of other things really, really matter. You know, it's like, huh, you know, all these things that I tried to achieve all these years. For you. For me. Right. That's okay. what I'm talking about, yeah. for me. Like, they, yeah. they aren't as important as I thought they were. The, the one thing I was going to ask you guys is, like, it kind of relates to your question earlier, Colt. Um, people see you guys as a multi-million dollar pedal mogul. Like, I don't know. Like, what what are some things that you, like, maybe are not immediately noticed by people that take some time to see in you that you wish that you, you wish people saw in me specifically you're asking yeah. about me both of you both of you rephrase I, that sorry say that one more time what are okay. some things i i think that i think that some of the greatest things about people are things that take time to really notice um why I like to be like invested in people because you end up seeing these things when you spend more time with them. So what are some things that aren't immediately apparent, like externally things that you like about yourself that you wish people saw? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I think for me, this is funny that the podcast is taking this direction, but um, that's fine. <laughs> um, I think for me, I, I'm really passionate. I, I mean, it could be pedals. We could be doing pedals. We could do, be doing, pencils or uh toys or you know designing furniture i really don't care um but i really my favorite thing to do is to craft um like a, like an employment place uh that, that gives people a chance uh to make a healthy living that don't necessarily want to sell out and and work for a corporation um and maybe didn't get a chance to to finish school um, the way they wanted to, um, but but there are there are educated people all around us in the world, but there are also very clever people, and I have a heart for clever people versus educated people, and so I'll take uh, I'll take two clever people over five educated people um, because I think it's clever people that end up uh, running the world in and making actual impact and actual change that, that progress society forward. So my heart is for clever people um, mm -hmm. and whatever I can do to make them feel uh, like they want to be somewhere for a long time, that that's what I'll do. If that makes sense. I also really enjoy mowing the lawn. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, I spent all last weekend, uh, I took down two dead trees and I've, I've turned them, all into I split the wood with a log splitter and and that was really great and I've got firewood for pretty much I've got two bricks of wood hopefully that gets me through the winter I enjoy working on those things too you'd like to be seen as a lumberjack 
I don't like to be seen. I didn't take any pictures of it. I just like doing it. Yeah. I am so lost since you related that. (laughs) What about about you, Philip? I'm, I'm, I'm so lost. That was so long. What was your question again? My question is, what are some things that aren't immediately apparent about you that people don't always notice that you like really like? (laughs) Oh man, I already showed this on what I'll, I'll get there. Uh, I honestly believe I, I have no filter. And so I feel like people actually get to know me, all of me that they want to know. And so that sounds bad. <laughs> but here's one thing that people don't know about <laughs> when they first meet me. So let me let me so tell the story. You're, if I've you're already... listening, if you're listening, uh, if you're just listening to the podcast, Philip is pulling his tooth out uh, <laughs> from his mouth because he has a fake tooth, and so he has it's a not retainer. Fake. Listen, let can me I, tell the no, story of me, what happened to my. No, tooth. let me explain what's happening, and then you can explain the story. So he's pulling a, basically like a retainer that is hosting one of his front teeth. And he's pulling it out, and when he pulls it out, he has a, a missing front tooth where he looks like uh, what's the guy from Tiger King. Oh, why we choose him? There's so many other options. Let's just go with Flea. Okay. Partial Flea. He looks like Flea. <laughs> Not as many teeth, but we'll go Flea. So, uh, yeah. So, about a year ago, my uh, year and a half ago, I accidentally taught my son how to pull a chair out from under somebody. And so, uh, he just witnessed me do it to somebody else. And then he did it the next day at the dinner table. And I tried to catch myself with my face on the table ended up cracking the top of my tooth where it's it's behind the gum so you can't see it made an appointment colt gave me the wrong place to go to so i didn't end up doing that like going to that appointment so i didn't give you the i, I gave <laughs> you him a, said i, I said a, what's the name of the place you i gave said, him a Clipper random dental i gave him a random dentist and i said tell him you know colt <laughs> yeah i called this place and i'm talking to the receptionist and he's next to me saying tell him you know me and i go hey by the way i know colt westbrook i work with colt westbrook <laughs> and the lady goes okay and i was like because i work at at Walrus Audio and she's like, okay. And then that should have been me realizing maybe this is the wrong place, but I didn't. So then like a week goes by, I am good. I'm going to leave for my appointment. And I'm like, I have to leave now. And he's like, why are you leaving so early? I was like, it's 45 minutes away. He's like, no, it's like 20 something. And I was like, no, it's 45 minutes away in Norman. And Colt goes, it's in Piedmont or something like that. I don't know. These are suburbs of Oklahoma City. Yes, these are. And so I'm like, well, they don't cover my insurance, so I cancel it. And I'm like, my tooth's fine. Well, a year goes by. I play tug of war with my son with a lovey in my mouth, which is a little blanket. My five-year-old. And I'm biting it. And he wraps it around his hand and jumps off the bed and takes my tooth. So he finished what he started. That's that's, and And I'm in the process of getting a new tooth. And now uh, eating across from Philip is a joy because he has to take the tooth out every single time. Every time. Uh, did he Did he have the tooth when we were in Fort Wayne together? Did he do that? No. Okay. So it's a new thing. So next, I've, She's seen it, I'm sure. Next time we're all together, either. we'll share a meal and you'll get to enjoy Philip's toothless mouth. You can hold on to my retainer. It's actually called a denture. Okay. Which is hard, to, hard to swallow. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> that's a hard truth to swallow. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hard to, to swallow. Uh, and on that note, <laughs> yeah, on that note. Okay, so last thing, I want you to send people uh, to the place where you want them to to gobble up your content. Where do Where do you want to send people? Listen to your music, uh, experience your art, go to your shows. Where Where do send them somewhere? Send them, launch them. Uh, you, if you want, you can check us out on. MySpace. Spotify, uh, I guess my band is called Covet Band. Okay. Um, that's the handle. And then uh, I also, I'm actually really excited about the solo stuff that I'm sitting on. It's been just like four years of slowly building up ideas and um, growing. So I, I'm really excited for that. And my name is Eva. Yeah, I'm really bad at plugs. Well, I'm really terrible. This is at, great. Um, we don't care. Do you have like a website like Yvette? Yeah. No, that's good. It'll do okay, Spotify. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, Spotify, yeah. Give Jimmy a, just Jimmy look up my name. Just she said name. earlier, <laughs> option. we don't want to give option paralysis, right? All right. Oh, man. Google, Google it. 
that's what I say, especially when people want to come by the shop. Like, what's the address? And I was like, Google it. To Google Walrus. All right. Hey, thanks for being on the show today. Thankful for mm-hmm. you. Um, you know, we love teaming up with artists that are uh, that one have a lot of skill, two have a lot of innovation, but third, um, the third thing that we love is just like. Uh, out of this world character and personality. So thank mm-hmm. you for being somebody who has a has a genuinely great soul, good heart, and uh, a beautiful mind. So thankful for you. Thank you. Thanks for thank being you. on the show today. All right. See ya. It was a pleasure. Later. See ya.